Hey, what's going on folks? It's Mike here and welcome to our software design series in C++ where we're going to be wrapping up our discussion of the Observer. So if you haven't watched the first parts in this series, go ahead and check out the description below and check out the playlist and make sure you watch the other parts here. Otherwise, we're just going to wrap up what we talked about and see what we've achieved with the Observer and I'll give you a few steps that you can think about to take this pattern further to meet your needs. So with that said, let's go ahead and dive into our code for a brief code review. Now, if you've been following this series from the start, this is what we've done here. We've created a few different files here. Again, we have our test case here in our main where we've created a subject here and a watcher class that inherits from some observer class. And we had this nice ability to subscribe immediately our observers to some subject that exists and then in a particular uh, bin or a functionality here and classify it. And then of course, any other construction that we need with our watcher here. So we can see how this pattern sort of works here and it's quite nice. And let's go ahead and see what that looks like. And let's go ahead and start with our uh, subject interface here. And again, the idea with the subject is we're just adding or removing uh, listeners from our collection here. And those are just stored in a map here. So relatively nice data structure here. Again, we have the number or rather the integer here that stores what type of bucket this is. Again, we might want to enhance this within a Noom class or something, but this could be bucket zero for the sound system, one for the graphic system, whatever type of event that we want to uh, specifically have our observer belong to. And then we have the list of the observers that's maintained here. And that's just what this type definition here, again, to make things a little bit cleaner with our C++. So from our subject, we can then create different subjects. I'll go ahead and just show you the concrete implementation of that. Again, we had the ability to add observers uh, one at a time here and remove them. And eventually you might want to go through in your destructor. And if the subject is responsible for removing the observers, then you can go ahead and have that set up here. Now you might have, depending on your application of the observer, uh, some external resource manager that actually freeze up these observers. So that's why I haven't done it here, but it would simply be iterating through the observer map and then um, using some sort of uh, erase if or remove if clause or, or some way to safely remove your uh, observers or watchers from your subject. Okay, so that's the idea here. This is the code that we've written in the previous uh, videos here. And then the power that we gave our subject in this particular instance is the ability to notify all of our observers or again, notify a specific subsystem. Again, maybe zero is the sound system, one is graphics, etc. And then we can just look through specific types of observers and go through that list here that we want to notify. So that was the idea there. Let's go ahead and take a brief recap of our observers here. Again, starting from the interface here. Again, relatively simple uh, interface. We just need our observers to be able to notify or do the action that they need to do when our subject broadcasts to them that, hey, some state or interesting event has occurred. So what I went ahead and did in this series was create, again, this uh, interface here, again, with a purely virtual function here. We like to do that in C++ so that we must implement this functionality in any class that's derived from our observer. So that's the idea there. And we have this watcher class here, again, uh, sort of defaulting into saying, well, we need a subject to exist so that we can subscribe to it. So that's part of the design here that I'm providing. Again, what type of bucket does it fall into zero being the sound system one graphics or whatever you decide uh, and then of course if you have any other parameters for your watcher that you might want to provide here now there might be some other patterns you could probably use or delegating constructors to make this a little bit of a cleaner system here or if you wanted to break this out into individual functions or use some sort of uh, builder pattern uh, to sort of build on top of this that could be some option as well but again, the basic idea is that we want to implement this on notify function. So let's go ahead and recap what we did there, just so you can see all the code in the video. And again, we made this relatively simple, right? Just subscribing our observer immediately uh, to the particular subject that we pass in here. Again, we're passing that by reference because we want to make sure this subject uh, exists. Otherwise, there's nothing for it to watch. Of course, the watcher here is removed when it goes out of scope. Um, and again, we do that from the subject's point of view. Again, you could have maybe some sort of trade-off here where once you're subscribed to a subject, maybe it lives with it. Again, it's going to sort of depend on your system here of how you want to use these 
um, observers here. They might go away with a subject or, you know, maybe you have an observer subscribe to multiple different subjects. And again, then you're going to have to sort of dive into things like the resource management with maybe smart pointer versus unique pointer and some of these different uh, things. And for the purpose of this demo, to make things really simple, every time our subject wanted to notify all or notify a particular type of observer, we just printed out that the observer was notified. Again, great way to just test out your system and see that things are working. So that's all the code kind of reviewed here. Let's kind of do a little bit of a wrap up regarding the actual pattern. And the way that I'd like to do this, again, I'll bring up our uh, slideshow here. I'm <laughs> thinking about, you know, is the pattern actually used? Um, well, you know, digging around some open source projects is a great way to see some of the use cases of the observer. And by doing this, you'll discover again, maybe some interesting use cases or alterations to this uh, basic pattern here. Again, having observers subscribe to some subject or publisher subscriber. Uh, again, you'll hear these different uh, types of things or listener is another term that's used. Um, so downloading some open source projects, I'll give you a few and just sort of grepping for the word observer is usually a handy way to find out these things. Again, grep for observer, subscriber, uh, listener, uh, and you'll kind of see different functionalities. So, you know, I know I'm talking in C++ here, but you know, Java has an interface for observers here. Okay, making some object uh, observable here. Uh, and it's a relatively old functionality here. So you can, you know, search this uh, on Java and just see how other languages uh, implement this pattern. A lot of languages learned and decided this pattern is so prevalent, just put it in the standard library. Um, you could look at some game engines. I think that's a great use case. Again, that's sort of uh, my domain knowledge in this sort of graphics and game stuff. Um, so going into Godot and grabbing around for Observer, there's lots of different uh, examples there. Blender 3D would be another great open source project to sort of dig around. Uh, Maya 3D, again, you can look at the API. It's a little bit older, but again, just to show that, you know, you have these I interface uh, type of classes here uh, to create observers. I think that's useful. And the Ogre uh, graphics engine, which I'm going to go ahead and uh, dive into uh, right now here. Uh, there was a nice case study on this uh, CPP depend uh, site, which is linked here on uh, Ogre and just, you know, how the tool is used. Um, so I thought that was kind of nice. Again, this using this tool to sort of grep around, but you can actually, you know, more simply just uh, go to the documentation and click on the class list. Um, and then just kind of dig around. Uh, I think in this case, I searched for a uh, listener uh, because that's what Ogre calls it. And, you know, there's some interesting listener classes here. So in particular, here was a listener class. And I thought this one was just interesting because, well, you know, you have your observer that you can create here. Um, but again, it's uh, sort of uh, setting up callbacks to indicate, you know, some resource has been loaded. And I think this would be a great use case, again, of uh, the observer in action. You know, if you're loading resources in the background um, and then having the um, subject being able to notify that a resource has been uh, loaded, I think that's probably a useful uh, sort of pattern to have here, again, for the observer. So. Um, this gets into other stuff, which I'm going to talk about uh, later, which could be, you know, the subject notifying some resources available or to start some process that could happen synchronously or asynchronously if you're talking about things like file or resource uh, uh, resources being loaded. Uh, so that's the basic idea here. You can kind of look around at some of those here. Uh, so let's go ahead and kind of wrap this up here. Um, you know, just some more ideas on the observer pattern that I found um, to give you some other options or that you might want to try to implement. Um, again, um, you know, in this series, I haven't shown you, I've been using just raw pointers to sort of subscribe, but you might look at raw, um, some smart pointers. Again, this can be quite important, um, you know, for various reasons. One, again, if you have your observer subscribe to multiple subjects, you might look into some sort of smart pointer class. Um, but again, you might have to be a little bit careful with, you know, uh, using shared pointers in that case and sort of thinking about the performance or, you know, where those um, objects are being used. OK, so uh, that can be, again, a sort of trade off that you use. Again, I would try to use unique pointers um, if you're able to. Um, some other recommendations, again, I've been using uh, ints or just regular enums. Um, so using an enum class might be a better way to set up, you know, the different messaging systems or, or events that you want to notify. Um, again, that I think is just a little bit more of a clean design. Again, making use of modern C++. Um, and then, of course, for simplicity, you know, you might want to consider, um, you know, using other data structures other than the forward list here. Uh, so if I go back to our, uh, let's go back to our uh, code actually here. 
And I'm going to go into the uh, subject here just to uh, show you what I mean by this uh, in the interface. Um, <clears throat> so again, we have uh, our map here um, and our uh, forward list here. So, you know, a map of, um, you know, these uh, observers in a list is, is simple enough to iterate through. But again, depending on what you might want to do, you might want to make this a vector. Maybe that'll be faster to traverse. Again, uh, just sort of depends. Um, and then this map, you might want to make unordered. Again, if the order doesn't matter that you are, you know, notifying the observers. So that's just something that you have to think about if you need that to be preserved or not. So just going back to your sort of fundamental uh, data structure knowledge there. Um, so again, uh, sort of some changes again, you know, thinking about uh, not using raw pointers here and perhaps a unique pointer if possible or shared pointer if you must share. Uh, thinking about does this need to be a list or maybe we could use a vector data structure or pre-allocate, you know, some sort of maximum of observers. And then think about map versus unordered map or, of course, your own uh, implementation there to get some performance bonus. Again, just depends on what you need here. Uh, so those are just a few of the ideas uh, that you might take further here. Uh, there's a neat idea here from the game programming uh, patterns book here on, uh, again, avoiding the dynamic reallocation. So again, if you are using those structures like vector, which could reallocate if you have a lot of uh, observers, um, thinking about either, again, fixing the size and just pre-allocating in your subject how many observers it could have, that could be reasonable. Again, it depends on your domain. If you're in games, for instance, I would argue you should sort of know uh, maximum sizes of allocations and some of these things or have an idea, um, right? That's a constraint in the game uh, you could profile for or sort of measure. Uh, so you could pre-allocate. Um, and otherwise, there was a sort of neat linked list implementation of the observer pattern um, that Bob Nystrom showed, uh, meaning that in your subject here, if you just take a look at this, you just uh, well, rather than creating the, you know, data structure for a linked list vector, these maps and so on, uh, you just have the uh, head of your list here. And then the observers, well, they all have a link uh, that they can, um, you know, point to the next observer. So that's how you traverse. Now, of course, when you remove one of the observers, you'll have to, uh, you know, reconnect those links and so on. But uh, I think this kind of captures the idea. And again, it could be a very clean and simple way to implement the observer pattern without use of the standard library. Again, just think about what your constraints are, and this is sort of a minimum implementation. In fact, this might be something uh, folks are interested in that I might want to go back and actually implement just to show uh, that this is actually kind of nice and clean. All right, so we're going to go ahead and revisit where we started in this series. I gave you sort of this uh, angry birds problem, and I said, you know, um, you know, how do you think this observer pattern is going to scale in this this problem now, now that we know a little bit about it. Well, you know, the truth is for this particular bird here, uh, if it collides into something and it's notifying all these different subsystems, I think that's probably going to be fine. It's probably going to be fine in a game like this, um, you know, running on a modern processor. We'd probably want to profile it. But again, we do have to consider that as these objects here collide with other objects and are sending, um, you know, more messages and these types of things, um, we could have a problem if there's just too many events registered per object um, and kind of having to iterate through everything. Um, so again, we might want to think about uh, the different queues where you could maybe asynchronously, you know, push events or into different threads. That's those are possible things that we might want to think about. Um, you know, if we need a lot of concurrency, we might want to think carefully about thread safe observer uh, patterns um, or, you know, different types of models of computation. So just something uh, there for us to think about. So anyways, let's go ahead and just kind of wrap things up here. A little bit of a conclusion of what we learned about on uh, what will be part five now. Um, you know, so I've shown you how to build the observer, uh, again, starting from the first video with just a very simple implementation of what it is. Uh, and then we've kind of walked through and added some different features showing you how you can get some different power with the observer pattern. So hopefully that's been enjoyable. Um, and again, no pattern is perfect. Again, you know, we start to have to think about some of these things at performance or scale, maybe, um, again, that you'll have to consider. So, um, I would argue though, that the pattern is relatively extensible. We've shown the interface. It's relatively easy to maintain. I think it's a, a simpler pattern. Uh, you know, I think it takes a little bit to understand, but it can be maintainable. And overall, it's, uh, you know, quite flexible in how it can be used or the different power that we can give to 
our subject and the observers. Uh, and again, take a look at some of those different variations. I think that's uh, something that could be useful for you to learn from and again, uh, maybe test against. Um, again, as I mentioned, thread safety could become an issue. Um, there's some different talks. Um, Tony Van Erd has one on thread safe uh, observer pattern from C++ now, so you can take a look at that. Uh, but again, I think it might be interesting. It just briefly looked at to the ogre case, but you know, if you're using the observer pattern in a way where you're loading resources um, at runtime, you might then look into std async, um, which I have a few videos on, so feel free to check out how that works um, and see if you can get away with asynchronously loading resources. Again, just utilizing some of the concurrency and so on on your processor. All right, folks, so with that said, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up Observer. It's been fun uh, so far in this series to kind of walk through slowly and build this progression. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you now understand the Observer pattern and it's not so much of a mystery. And I hope you'll find uh, new and interesting ways to implement it or create different alterations. If you do, feel free to comment below or otherwise uh, reach out. And with that said, folks, thank you for your time and attention. Uh, thank you for those who subscribed while watching this. And I'll look forward to seeing you in the next videos.